historical societies, uh, certainly libraries out there that are working hard to preserve those stories and, and those memories. And uh, uh, this book may be a, a small way to kind of do that too. So it's kind of an encyclopedia of uh, all those things, wild, weird, and, 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 and wacky, and Maine, and wonderful. And it's kind of an encyclopedia as well. It has uh, the list of the, the 10 largest lakes, the 10 tallest mountains, the 10 longest rivers. Uh, it has the list of all the world record holders in Maine. Um, it covers all the covered bridges. It lists the governors and what I call the stuff of Maine, the official bird, the official tree, the official snack food, the official dessert. And then there was something that wasn't necessarily unique to Maine, but what I call the capitals of Maine. Especially in the late 1800s, every community wanted to be unique and wanted to have a claim to fame. And Phillips became known as the toothpick capital of Maine. And Franklin was the granite capital, Belfast was the broiler capital. So um, folks that didn't necessarily have any big claim to fame were often the gateway or the crossroads. But um, I think that uh, it just shows that kind of Maine spirit. And, and Abbott, Maine, if any of you have driven up on the way to Greenville, there's a sign that goes, Maine's first town. Well, of course, Maine's first town was down on the coast. I believe it was Pondlebury, Pondlebury. and But Abbott alphabetically is Maine's first town. So they've got it on the sign and, and it's a great claim to fame. <clears throat> so the way you use Wild Weird Wonderful Maine is to um, uh, look at each of the items. It's divided into five different zones geographically of Maine. And at the end of every item, is the coordinates on a main atlas and gazetteer map if you would like to go to that spot. And the idea is to kind of get out there, explore Maine, <clears throat> excuse me, have some fun. And so as we collected these stories and started to put them into a spreadsheet, it wasn't long be before I had about 600 potential items to include in the book and we winnowed it down to about 300. Uh, however, as we collected photographs and what have you, I, I ended up with a database. I've got over 2,500 photographs now of historical events and things in Maine and took a lot of them myself and my travels and other friends contributed them and uh, it made it a lot of fun. And I met a lot of wonderful people from, from Kittery to Fort Kent who helped me uh, put this, this particular book together. So anyway, let's, we'll get started and I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the crazy things and in, in the indomitable spirit of, uh, of people in Maine. So we first start out, there's just, whether it's uh, fictitious guides, loggers in the backwoods, uh, fishermen along the coast, there are just all kinds of, of uh, great stories about things that go on in Maine. And the, the first place I'd like to touch on is Maine's Real Pet Cemetery, and we all certainly heard of Stephen King's book and, and film of the same name, which much of it was actually filmed in Maine, some in this area up around Mount Desert Island, and I believe some down in the, the uh, mid-coast area as well. Well, Governor Baxter, who would serve as Maine's governor from 1921 to 1925, went on to purchase personally Baxter State Park and give it to the state, really loved his animals. And uh, where his estate was on Mackworth Island, in uh, Portland, in Falmouth, actually, um, he created his own pet cemetery. And uh, in it are uh, 14 of his beloved English setter dogs and a horse named Jerry Roan, who was, he considered, quote, a noble horse and true friend. Well, one of the interesting quirks with Governor Baxter was that he named about 17 of his dogs um, Gary. There was Gary 1, Gary 2, Gary 3, Gary 4. <clears throat> But one of the most notable ones was uh, called Gary Owen, who was actually Gary too. And when he died while Governor Baxter was in office, uh, he had the dog's body taken to Mackworth Island to be interred. And he ordered that the flags at the Capitol be put at half staff in honor of his deceased dog, which didn't uh, serve too well with the, uh, with the, the uh, opposition party in Augusta at that time. I like to refer to one incident in Maine's history called Maine's Not So Great Escape. And uh, many folks don't realize that there were several prisoner of war camps in Maine uh, during World War II. Uh, the largest one was uh, in Holton. There were some in Washington County. And then 
near Jackman, up near Spencer Lake in a place called Hobstown, where they had 300 German prisoners and they had them work in the woods and they had them uh, harvest ice and cut trees and do things of that nature just to uh, keep them kind of out of trouble. And they really depended as much as on any fence uh, on the terrain to uh, keep them from trying to escape. Well, uh, on, while on an ice fishing, or excuse me, ice harvesting detail in March of 1945, three of the prisoners made an escape. They had squirreled away some rations and they had fashioned crude snowshoes. And according to one article at the time, they created a, a compass out of a magnetized needle in a peach can that worked, quote, as well as one from L.L. Bean. And uh, uh, it launched the largest manhunt in Maine history, 50 law enforcement people, state police, FBI, game wardens, and uh, they couldn't find the men over several days. And they talked to a hermit that lived in the area of the Forks. And they said, where are we gonna find these guys? Where are they gonna end up? Because he knew the terrain. And he said, wait a couple of days, go down near the confluence of these two streams. That's where they're naturally gonna come out. And they went there five days later and huddling, shivering in a lean-to were those prisoners, which they captured and brought back. And uh, eventually the school children at the uh, uh, school in Jackman, uh, Forest Hill Schools. You can see this monument on the right. That oven from the camp's kitchen is all that really remains of, of that facility. And they put a memorial there just to kind of commemorate the, the history of the place. Um, I go too far. No. Um, one of the my favorite uh, stories in Maine involves Cutler and the last voyage of Jeanette Corbett. And in 1873, she was 26 years old and had married a 27-year-old sea captain and they set off with a load of lumber to sell in Cuba and bring back rum or molasses or whatever. And while there, she contracted a fatal disease and could have been yellow fever at the time. And she died and on her deathbed, uh, she asked her husband who pledged that he would bring her back and bury her in Maine because she didn't want to be left in the tropics. And uh, the problem was, here it is in, in uh, late summer of 1873, there is no refrigeration. How do you get a body back to the state of Maine intact when it's gonna take you several weeks? So they used what they had on hand and they put her in a barrel and they filled it with rum and put her on board the schooner, uh, the uh, Lana Thurlow and sailed back for Maine. And when she arrived, they went to the undertaker and said, we want it done upright. We want a good funeral. And the undertaker said, I'm not gonna open that barrel. I have no idea what she died from and I don't wanna unleash it on this community. So the family reluctantly agreed and they dug a large circular hole and buried her barrel and all in the cemetery in Cutler. And uh, that's a picture of her grave uh, today. And uh, I think it really shows some of the, the ingenuity and perseverance of uh, people from Maine. Um, a lot of folks don't realize it, but Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, uh, three years before the Civil War began, actually came and spent several weeks in down East Maine. He was uh, a U.S. Senator. He was a former Secretary of War, and he visited the Blueberry Barrens down East where they were working on a surveying project, and he and his wife, Varnia, stopped at Lead Mountain, uh, which at that time was called Humpback, and they were told the air would be good for what ailed him as he was a fairly sickly fellow. And that project, interestingly enough, was being run by a surveyor who was the great grandson of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, so there's still a trail to the summit today, which is called the Jeff Davis Road. And there was a local legend that in in the center that he had left a trunk there for a mysterious pickup some months later. And there was speculation it was the secret plans for the Civil War, but actually it was just surveying documents and there was nothing nefarious about it. Uh, Margaret Hamilton, who played the Wicked Witch in, uh, in The Wizard of Oz, one of the iconic characters, uh, scaring little children with the words, I'll get you my pretty, uh, for generations, uh, actually uh, has ties to Maine. And in 1961, she purchased a house on Cape Island off uh, Cape Newhagen in Southport. And she was actually very well liked by area residents, didn't scare the children. And she frequently row back and forth between the town dock and her private pier. And uh, people ultimately dubbed that island Witch's Island. And uh, according to Bass Harbor writer Lori Schreiber, one day she fell into the 
water trying to get out of her rowboat and a lobsterman saved her and was surprised that she hadn't disappeared in a, in a big uh, puff of smoke. And her family still uh, owns that property to this day. Another kind of connection to cinematic villainry, villainry is, is uh, MDI's gentle giant, uh, Gunnar Hansen, who is an actor from Northeast Harbor, and I uh, had the good fortune to be friends with him. And uh, his greatest claim to fame was that in 1974, he was out of work and he was in Austin, Texas, and he auditioned for the part of Leatherface in the low budget film, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which went on to certainly become a classic. Uh, he starred in a few other kind of off-Broadway off type films, including Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, uh, which many of you undoubtedly have never heard of. Uh, back in Maine here, he was a wonderful local historian, one of the gentlest and most soft-spoken people that you'd ever want to meet. And uh, he ultimately published a book, Texas Chainsaw Confidential, about that. But unfortunately, he passed away in uh, 2015. I think one of the unsung heroes of Maine that uh, many people are unfamiliar with is Frances Perkins. And uh, she and her family had great ties to the Newcastle area. And uh, she was brought on board by Franklin Roosevelt uh, as part of the, uh, to get rid of the New Deal or get the New Deal and, and, and get out of the depression. And really it was her work as labor secretary that had resulted in the minimum wage, the 40 hour work week, Social Security, and almost everything else. As a matter of fact, she was the first female cabinet officer in United States history. And the only item that she didn't get finished, which she regretted later in her life, was universal health care. And of course, we're still working on that. Um, and in 2008, the Francis Perkins Center was founded to preserve her legacy in the homestead, which is along the Damascata River. Everybody talks about ancient aliens and uh, whether there are ancient alien astronauts and people had help from above, but uh, Maine has its own brush with ufology. In uh, 1976, uh, several paddlers from Massachusetts on the Allagash Wilderness Waterway, uh, twin brothers and two of their friends, uh, reported they saw fast moving lights in the sky and that they were then abducted by four fingered aliens, which they called grays and taken into their spacecraft. And I think the word used at the time was probed. Uh, they reported it to a ranger, uh, but it uh, didn't get a lot of traction. And in 2016, um, one of the men admitted that they might have been doing some recreational substances uh, that evening. I think uh, one of the greatest stories in Maine is those amazing Stanley brothers uh, from Kingfield. And they were twin brothers, Francis Edgar and Freeland Oscar Stanley. And they were born in 1849 and graduated from the University of Maine at Farmington. They went into teaching, but they were just prolific inventors that in, in addition to being early pioneers of the steam car and hence the term, the Stanley steamers, they also invented the artist airbrush and created dry plate photography, which revolutionized that industry. Uh, their steam car was the first motor vehicle to climb Mount Washington. It took it nearly two hours to cover seven miles, but it made it. And in 1906, the Stanley steamer set the world speed record on a beach in Florida at 127 miles an hour. Um, I think uh, you can see the patent there that they had in the upper left for the artist airbrush and a way to atomize paint. And I think the, the best thing that they made the most money from uh, was dry plate photography. Before that, there were a lot of noxious chemicals that were necessary, and they ended up selling that process and that patent to George Eastman, who went on to find found the company Kodak and had it not been for the Stanleys, that company probably never would have been founded to become the photography giant that it is. In the lower in the center, there is a picture of the Stanley Hotel in Estes Park, Colorado. Uh, they built a mountain wagon, which was a large vehicle to take guests back and forth. That hotel inspired Maine author Stephen King to write The Shining and after he had stayed there. And um, they also had some television series that were filmed there. And last but not least on the right is their sister, Chancenetta Amons, who 
was an incredible photographer and some of her photographs of working people and workaday situations of everyday life are considered icons of uh, those years when most people weren't paying attention to anything like that. Maine did have its uh, flood of biblical proportions with a completion of the Long Falls Dam which uh, on the Dead River, which resulted in the creation of Flagstaff Lake, which is the fourth largest lake in Maine. As the water rose in 1950, it totally inundated three communities, uh, many of which the buildings had been moved and uh, they were sold out to central Maine power, including churches were moved, although some were just left there and, and uh, the water was, they were allowed to be submerged. One of the historical losses there is that flag, the village of Flagstaff was named for a flagpole reportedly erected by Benedict Arnold on his ill-fated expedition to Quebec in 1777, which is profiled in Kenneth Roberts' book, Arundel. Uh, the water's 50 foot deep now and, it, and there's two Air Force jets at the bottom, which uh, crashed and plunged in there in 1959. Uh, as the water flooded those villages, typical Maine, it was turned into a tourist attraction and there were several boat operators that would take people out to see the drowned villages, including one named Captain Wing who built his vessel as Noah's second ark. Some of you that are long in the tooth, such as myself, may remember on Sundays, there was a wonderful television program called uh, The Flying Fisherman, which starred a guy named Gadabout Gaddis, who uh, his actual name was Roscoe Vernon Gaddis, Gaddis, and uh, he tooled around North America and his beloved uh, Piper Cherokee and combined his love of fishing and flying into a television show. And uh, he also starred on some episodes of Outdoors with Liberty Mutual and things of that nature. And an airport is uh, now named for him up in the, in the Bingham area. Now, what was amazing when Gaddis did these shows, he and a single cameraman would go somewhere for a week and they would just take whatever pictures they had. They didn't have any sound. They added that later. And whatever happened, that's what they actually showed. So if they went for a week and didn't get a single bite, they put, produced the half hour of television where the flying fisherman didn't get any fish. Um, uh, he was eventually honored uh, by the Maine, Maine Aeronautics Association, which has named a major service award, the Gadabout Gaddis Cup. And his airfield is now uh, Great Northern, uh, not Great Northern, but uh, North Main Rivers Rafting is, is located on that property now. There are several geographers from Florida about a decade ago set out to determine Maine's most remote spot. And they determined that it was in the backcountry in Baxter State Park near a place called Wasada Cook Lake. And the waterfall on the left is a photograph I took. It was not far from there, probably less than a quarter of a mile. Well, their um, criteria was that they would not, uh, what was the furthest from any paved, or excuse me, any regularly traveled road, not a dead end, not a logging road. And it's more than six miles from any passable road. I think the amazing thing is that there isn't any place in Maine that's more than six miles from a passable road. And uh, at one time, this valley bustled with logging camps. There were no trees at all left in there between fires and, and the Lumberman's Act and Katahdin is about six miles to the south. And the geographers wisely decided not to reveal the exact coordinates, only its general location because they didn't want people going there and, and ruining the spot. <clears throat> uh, presidential can candidate Teddy Roosevelt, uh, there's a picture of him here astride a bull moose swimming in a lake. And Roosevelt was no stranger to Maine. Uh, he visited numerous times as a boy and an adult. Uh, he stopped, he toured Moosehead Lake, he climbed Katahdin, and he once visited friends in Bar Harbor and spent several weeks in the summer. Most often, though, he spent time in Arusta County in the town of Island Falls. And there he met two guides, Wilmot Dow and uh, uh, Wilmot Dow and Bill Sewell. And then the picture on the left, the guy that looks like he's wearing too fancy a scarf, that's actually Teddy Roosevelt. And the other two men are his main guides. And what's really interesting is they went on to run his ranch out west because he, he developed such a fond friendship with them. And, and the Sewell house in Island Falls today is a bed and breakfast if you wanted to go sleep in where Teddy Roosevelt once slept. Um, the interesting thing about the picture of Roosevelt and the moose, and this is probably one of the earliest examples of Photoshop. 
because Roosevelt never actually, of course, rode a moose. They had a picture of him on a horse. They had a picture of the moose in the lake and in the dark room, they put the two together and used that as a campaign photo. It ran in newspapers all over the country uh, where 90% of them neglected to mention that it was an altered photo and, and let people believe that Teddy Roosevelt could do that. Up uh, near the top of Cadillac Mountain in, in uh, Katie National Park, there's this mysterious cross that's carved into the pink granite. And uh, people have often wondered for years, the legend was that it had been left by the crew of Samuel D. Champlain who discovered the island in September of 1604. Um, no one ever took into account that if you're a busy explorer, you had to repair a ship because he struck a ledge and was taking on some water that why his men would have all this time to climb to the top of the tallest mountain around here every day and with rudimentary toll, uh, tools chisel a big cross into the granite. Uh, subsequent um, investigation in the 20th century, century revealed that they were actually done by surveyors in the late 1800s as they laid out part of the lands that would become uh, part of Acadia National Park. But if you hike up the Northridge Trail, you can go by this cross and if you want to imagine it was left there 400 years ago or so, I, I guess you can do that. <clears throat> Maine has a lot of places that are uh, related to the term devil or to related to the word hell. And uh, the famous sign uh, in the center at the top uh, up near Kakajo, it said, this is God's country why I set it on fire and make it look like hell. There's uh, Hell's Gate, which is a, a, a area of rapid currents and ragged rocks uh, down near the Booth Bay area. There's the Devil's Pulpit off Bald Head. And then uh, there's Devil's Den uh, over in Western Maine. And finally, they had the ovens in Bar Harbor, which are sea caves that are carved by the action of waves. And when that was first discovered, it was publicized as the Devil's Den. And then people decided maybe the tourists don't want to come here because of that. Uh, so they changed the name to the ovens. I think my favorite hell story for Maine involves a place in a remote lake in Washington County, uh, which is Cislodopsis Lake. And reportedly, a man named Sam Hill was rafting a hemlock bark for a local tannery across the lake, and a bunch had broken loose. And he jumped into the water to swim out and retrieve it. And they said, his friend said, don't do that. You, you know, you're, you're going to die. And he said, I'll get that back. Or, and, uh, or go to hell before breakfast. Well, he got his wish because he disappeared before uh, he could get there and before he could bring it back. And to this day on some of the earlier maps, that cove is called Hell Before Breakfast Cove on Cislodopsis Lake. A little closer to the Rockland area, I think this is one of my favorite stories is that Maine is home to the invention of the donut hole. And uh, in 1847, 16-year-old Hanson Gregory uh, was tired of the kind of squarish, soggy in the middle, not quite done fried cakes of the day and realized that if he punched a hole in the center that he would be able to fry it up and it would be crisp and, and well done. And he had a tinsmith make up the first donut cutter and then he had his mother and his sister start to uh, sell them as well. Um, he supposedly, uh, did it, other people believe, because you could put the donut on the handles on the ship's wheel while you were on duty and, and they wouldn't disappear. Well, he died in, in 1921 and in the 1940, the World's Fair actually had an exhibit about the donut hole and included a portrait of him. And on the 100th anniversary of his discovery, a stone marker and plaque was put out on at 179 Old County Road in Rockport. So uh, there's actually a, a marker commemorating the uh, creation of uh, Maine's foremost, one of Maine's most famous exports, whether you're a Timmy, Hint or Timmy Hortons fan or um, Dunkin' Donuts. The uh, only in Maine would someone save a couch that somebody died on. And what's really kind of interesting is Hannibal Hamlin, who was Abraham Lincoln's vice, first vice president, um, uh, he was born in 1809 and he was a senator and uh, he was a member of the Terratine Club as he uh, grew older. Uh, he was in his 80s and uh, he fell ill while playing cards and collapsed and fell unconscious. And so the members stretched him out on this couch and got him a 
sniffed her brandy and, and tried to revive him with some ammonia and, and also keep him comfortable, but he died a few hours later. And uh, just they always kind of remembered that couch is where he had died. And today it actually sits in the lobby of the Bangor Public Library. And that sign that's uh, in the middle of the couch there asks people, please don't sit on the couch. And considering what happened to the last person that did, I don't know if that's that big of a problem. Uh, in my travels in Maine, I heard this term, bumpus barrel, and it's like, is that some kind of a colorful character? Was it somebody who made a really good breakfast uh, uh, or, or was drank too much beer? I had no idea whatsoever. Well, the bumpus barrel was actually the largest chunk of barrel gemstone ever discovered in the world, and it was uh, unearthed in 1928. And uh, where they're also mining for amethyst and some emerald and, and tourmaline as well. Well, that one crystal is 27 feet long and weighed 52,000 pounds. And it went off, uh, specimens were sent off to museums around the world, including the Natural History Museum in New York and to Harvard. Uh, the largest piece eventually came back to be placed in the Maine Mineral and Gem Museum in, in Bethel in 2017. So it did come back. And the fact is that it was barrel and it was from a little tiny town that doesn't even show on the map anymore called Bumpus. And that's how it got, got the name. And the, interestingly enough, the first person to uncover gemstones in Maine uh, was a young man who was up on the mountain at sunset and a tree had overturned. And when he turned, he saw all these shiny things in the soil of the roots of the tree. And that individual was Hannibal Hamlin's brother. So it kind of ties into the, the other one as well. <clears throat> they talk about uh, Bangor's very Brady shootout. In 1937, public enemy number one, uh, James L. Brady, showed up with his gang in, in Bangor, Maine, and they had already committed four murders and over 200 robberies, and they went into Dakin's sporting goods store, and they wanted to purchase a pair of 45 caliber automatic handguns and paid with cash. Well, the clerk thought that was a little unusual and notified the authorities, and a few late days later, the gang came back and asked about buying a Thompson submachine gun. The clerk said they were illegal, but maybe come back and he might have some uh, contacts with local rum runners that might be able to help him out. Well, when they did return several days later, the FBI, the Maine State Police were waiting and uh, they realized the jig was up. And as they raced out of Dakin's, the Brady's gang began firing and uh, the shootout happened in the street. Over 60 shots were fired and Brady ended up laid out right in the middle of the trolley tracks. And uh, today that granite block on the right is in the sidewalk near that spot. And uh, you can still visit that today. That's uh, on, I believe it's Exchange Street. Uh, back in 1857, uh, the Coastal Survey was directed by Congress to do all new maps in the United States. And they determined they needed 10 super straight lines, baselines between Maine and Georgia to use as a jumping off place for the geometry to be able to actually measure and uh, survey the entire country. Well, one of the sites, the most easternmost one, was uh, on the Blueberry Barrens in Epic, Maine, just north of Harrington's, not too far from Machias. So over the course of a month, crews measured and remeasured and measured again before placing monuments at each end and a rough road now uh, called the Baseline Road runs across there. And the margin of error was less than two inches in 5.4 miles. Now that's the project that uh, um, Jefferson Davis had come down to Maine to oversee. Unfortunately, over the years, people have vandalized the different monuments that were at each end. One is now in the State Museum and the other one's in the collection of the uh, uh, Cherryfield Historical Society. This is a little closer to Rockland too. It's uh, Robert Scoglin, the, uh, the humble farmer who, and I always like to say the obelisk in his front yard of his bed and breakfast, uh, I call it the not so humble farmer monument. And uh, he was of course a newspaper columnist and he just decided to put up that obelisk with a, with a steel monkey on the top and proclaim that it was the center of the universe. And who's to prove him wrong? Because if the universe is infinite in every direction, I think we could all put that in our yard. And uh, uh, according to Google, the center of the universe is somewhere in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but I think we could argue about that too. You have to be pretty tough to 
to be a motorcycle rider up in uh, Rista County, up near Madawaska. I saw an interview with uh, uh, Senator King the other night who said people told him he'll always be a motorcycle rider, he won't be a biker. And, uh, but if you are a biker and you want to do the Four Corners tour, Madawaska is one of the four corners of the continental United States for people that are collecting that to do the entire circuit of the country on a motorcycle. The other spots are Blaine, Washington, San Yoshito, California, and Key West. And a local man named Joe LaChance came up with the idea for a park to commemorate that corner. And uh, riders who finish are eligible to have their names put on a a brick paving stone there. And then he and his wife also uh, created the Four Corners of Main Ride. And if you complete that four times, you get a special pin that proclaims you're a member of the Titanium Butt Club. And you get a, a t-shirt for that too. So if you if you think you have a strong derriere, that, I guess that's the place to go. A lot of folks don't un realize that Maine was the birthplace of chewing gum. And it, it actually started out in the woods with spruce gum, which uh, I've tried some of the original spruce gum. And it's probably as crunchy and foul tasting and, and not so uh, wonderful as you can think. But uh, as they improved it and, and made the formula more flavorful, John Baker Curtis created the country's first large scale chewing gum factory in Portland in 1866. And uh, he added wax and sugar to the spruce gum just to try to make it a, a little more palatable. And uh, the building is still there, although uh, the company itself, of course, is, is long gone. Mainers certainly prized their Moxie, and Moxie has a lot of great connections here. In 1876, Dr. Augustus Thompson of uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, who was a native of Union, Maine, uh, created what he called Moxie nerve food. And there's some who believe there may have actually been uh, an element of uh, cocaine or some other substance in the original formula. But uh, ideally, it's supposedly based on that gentian root. Um, uh, Moxie was favored by President Calvin Coolidge, author E.B. White, and, and Ted Williams was a big promoter. And it was named the official soft drink of Maine in 2005. Uh, since 1982, the town of Lisbon has had an annual parade and uh, festival in, uh, in honor of Moxie. And on the left, uh, as they were promoting Moxie in the early part of the the 20th century, they created a 33 foot tall Moxie bottle house. And uh, that was eventually rescued from obscurity somewhere else in the country uh, by members of the New England Moxie Congress. And it's now on display at the Matthews Museum of Maine Heritage in, in Union, Maine, along with, with other items. Uh, today, Moxie is produced by the Coca-Cola Company. Not to be directly tied to the soft drink is Moxie Falls, which is the largest cascade in Maine. It's up in a place called Moxie Gore, which is an irregular shaped town because surveyors couldn't quite keep things straight uh, when the places are actually uh, laid out. So it's 90 feet tall and tumbles into the gorge. Supposedly, Moxie is an Abenaki word for dark water. And although the stream above the falls may seem to be an inviting place, uh, several people who tried to swim at the top end uh, have gone over the falls and been severely injured. I think one of the, the, the most uh, forlorn monuments that I've come across or markers in Maine is the Terratine marker, which is uh, located about a mile south of what's called, or north of what's called the Terratine Crossing between Jackman and Rockwood, Maine. And it commemorates a crew of guys that were working on the railroad. The Canadian Pacific was rushing to create their continental links through Maine in 1888. And there was a tragic explosion and uh, the varying numbers of people were killed. Some say three, some say six, others say 13. And the irony is, as terrible as that accident was, because they were immigrant laborers and believed to be from Italy, it wasn't reported in the papers and people didn't talk about it. Well, not long afterwards, someone, and there, there's no records exactly who, uh, created this monument. And the RAM, the letters on the monument, no one's exactly sure what they mean. They may refer to Royal Arch Masons because of the uh, symbolism uh, there. But uh, it's about a mile walk down the railroad tracks. You have to be careful. It is a live railroad line. Uh, but you can see that yourself as well.
One of other uh, Maine's other enduring legacies is the B-52 crash site uh, east of Greenville. In 1963, a B-52 bomber was doing low-level training in, in the middle of January, and literally the tail section fell off, and it crashed on the east side of, of Elephant Mountain, and the plane in itself uh, went down on the west side, and only the pilot, co-pilot, and navigator who had ejection seats were able to get out. The co-pilot died on, on land, on impact, and the pilot and navigator were seriously injured, but they were alone, it was dark, and temperatures were hovering at minus 30. So searchers used snow plows to go through 15-foot drifts to get as close as they could on a woods road, and were eventually able to uh, bring them to safety. And uh, to this day, the Moosehead Rider Snowmobile Club, uh, which had placed a stone on the site, uh, commemorates the crash and the service of the the brave men and women and the, one of the ejection seats and part of an engine are now part of the Moosehead Historical Society collection. And if you, you can go there in summer or winter, it's a big snowmobile destination. Uh, all that folks ask is just don't remove any of the items uh, from the site. I think there's a cemetery in Rockport that uh, really has the, the best and the worst of uh, how to take care of of our youngest and most vulnerable citizens. And in April of 1940, a uh, very young baby, maybe only several weeks old, was found floating in a quarry in Rockland. And uh, the baby had already died before it was put in the water, but birth records were checked and a reward offered and no one could find out uh, who the baby belonged to or who it might be. But people did donate money to create a proper burial spot in the Seaview Cemetery in Rockport and a simple stone, unknown unwanted baby boy, uh, is there and people to this day continue to leave toys and, and, and other items of uh, in not great intrinsic value, but st certainly sentimental value to honor that baby. And at the exact opposite end of that same cemetery is the grave of pediatrician and Benjamin Spock, who in 1946 wrote Common Sense Baby Care and Child Care, which became the Bible for uh, baby boom generation's parents for bringing up their kids. Uh, he sold over 50 million copies of that book and, and enjoyed coming to his house in Camden and sailing his boat Turtle. And uh, so when he died, he asked to be buried there. So I think that it's uh, the best and the worst at opposite ends of, of the cemetery. Uh, I mentioned before the different capitals of Maine. Brian Pond is certainly not uh, any stranger when it comes to one-upmanship, its claim to fame is it has the world's largest clothespin sign, and uh, they like to promote that as well. And uh, however, on Main Street, the Jefferson Masonic Lodge's back house is one of the few exa remaining examples of a three-story tall outhouse that remains in use. Plumbing wasn't even installed in the building until the year 2000, and uh, only on the first floor. Uh, lightning hit the building in 2006, but the three-story privy survived uh, intact. Uh, not, not to be totally outdone, the Grange Hall next door has the two-story outhouse. And uh, uh, in continue with perhaps some scatological notoriety, uh, a nearby garage has just been converted by Fox News personality Tucker Carlson to be a television studio. So I think uh, Maine has a long relationship with outhouses back in the years from lumber camps to farms and the, the world record holder for Maine outhouses, the number of holes was one that had eight at a lumber camp uh, up in the Allagash region. Um, over in Blue Hill at Blue Hill Academy, we have what I like to call the snack that will not die. And uh, people always say that if we have an apocalypse, 20 years later, the only thing that will be left is Twinkies and cockroaches. And uh, uh, one Blue Hill High School students decided to do an experiment in, in 1976 to see how long an unwrapped Twinkie would go without spoiling or turning moldy. And they put it in a glass case and you can see the picture of it. That's a, a recent picture from last year of it. It's still going strong, uh, even though the company says their average shelf life should only be 25 days. Well, the teacher that did that, uh, teacher Roger Benetti, uh, thought that was a great way. And so for 44 years now, that Twinkie has survived intact, even though the company that makes it long ago filed for bankruptcy. And uh, the uh, case now resides in the headmaster's office. And he was a student in that class that uh, put that 
Twinkie under glass. Arusta County has a, a great relationship with the woods industry and with chainsaws and uh, chainsaws first were adopted around 1920 and uh, they were giant things that took several men to move but they were certainly easier than ax and crosscut saws. Well, over the last few years, Louis Pelletier in the village of Allagash uh, has created a chainsaw museum and he has over 400 different chainsaws and the museum is open to the public and you can see left-handed saws, different sizes, different configurations, some that were even mounted on wheels. And uh, 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 Pelletier's other claim to fame is that right up the road is his sister Kathy who is one of Maine's uh, foremost writers, uh, Kathy Pelletier. Um, a lot of stories in Maine, some are real, some are imagined. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between the two. And uh, one of the more mythical characters created was this fellow on the left, Malunkus Harry. And what was interesting, I first found these postcards uh, at antique shops and I said, was this some famous guide I hadn't heard about it? I looked into it more and come to find out it was an entirely imaginary character created to uh, 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 promote a hunting and fishing lodge on Malunkus Lake. And uh, an artist named Wesley Herrick, he went on to uh, uh, do many postcards and original artworks. Uh, Luncus means stream in a ravine, but uh, Harry supposedly was a glued and an oaf and, uh, and never seemed to get much work done. And there's actually a fellow today who self-publishes a little book called Short Stories from the Maine Woods about Malunkus Harry. And you can either send him money, he says, or trade him for his favorite brand of gunpowder, bullets or permission to hunt on your land. Uh, down in Southern Maine, the, the Saco River has uh, believed to be cursed ever since the first settlers emerged to the region. And back in 1675, uh, some of the early European inhabitants reportedly uh, threw a uh, chieftain's son into the river, believing, uh, wanted to test a rumor that uh, Native American children could not drown, that they would always float. Uh, in in uh, reprisal for that, Squandro uh, went and placed a curse and said that every year uh, that uh, no one would be safe until three people had died in the Saco River each year. And for 50 years, people believed that and they went on into the 1800s. And even in 1947, uh, the Maine Sunday Telegram had a headline saying Saco River outlives curse of Indian chief after no one actually drowned in the river that year. Uh, Maine has a little claim to fame with uh, Lucky Lindbergh, Charles Lindbergh, who toured the state right after he got back from uh, his famous transatlantic, the first solo crossing in the spirit of St. Louis. And uh, during his promotional tour, he was scheduled to stop in Scarborough and airport and go to Portland and it was too foggy. So he circled for quite a while until he set the spirit of St. Louis down on the beach at Old Orchard, which actually was designated as the town's landing field at the time. Uh, he hung out with famous aviator, Harry Jones, who happened to have a hangar there and was doing airmail flights and things of that nature. Uh, Lindbergh eventually got up to Portland, did his, did his speech and, and then continued. Uh, he also had some other ties to Maine in that the packing crate that the Spirit of Lewis came back from France uh, on a steamer uh, was turned into a museum in uh, Canaan. And unfortunately, about two years ago, it was closed to the public, but uh, it's, it's still there. They put a little roof on it. It looks like a little building, but it's actually the Spirit of St. Louis packing crate. And then uh, Lindbergh's wife, Ann Mora Lindbergh, spent many uh, summers on North Haven Island in Penobscot Bay. She was the first woman ever to be licensed to fly gliders and uh, she was an author in her own right. And so I think there's a, quite a bit of connection there. Uh, Chester Green went 15 years old. He got tired of his ears being cold when he was skating. So he asked his grandmother to sew some tufts of beaver fur onto a piece of wire and created the first set of earmuffs in 1873. Uh, he patented the idea uh, at the age of 19, a couple of years later, and founded a company that went to create earmuffs for more than 60 years. In 1936 alone, they made and shipped 400,000 pairs. Uh, Greenwood also went on to start a bicycle business, created the town's first telephone network, and tinker with the heating system technology. So uh, Maine celebrates Chester Greenwood Day on December 21st. 
first one was in 1977 and they have a parade uh, in Farmington and a lot of other great events. And probably after COVID, we'll all be able to go to those kind of things. Uh, Maine's uh, connection to invention wasn't always necessarily in a, in a positive vein. Uh, Hiram Maxson from Sangerville applied his genius to everything from sprinkler systems to amusement rides to claiming that Edison stole the idea for the incandescent light bulb from him. But he'll be always remembered for inventing the 500 shot per minute machine gun in 1884. He and Edward Vickers went on to produce it in England. Uh, he would reportedly test his designs in his garden and ran newspaper announcements in the local papers warning his neighbors to keep their windows open to avoid any potential for broken glass. And uh, he suffered deafness later in years, believed to be from the exposure to all that gunfire, but he was knighted by Queen Victoria in 1900. And one of the interesting things is that he wasn't the only one from Maine to be knighted and he wasn't the only one from Sangerville, which is a really small village uh, uh, in mid up in the sort of the middle to lower northern part of the state. Um, Sir Harry Oakes uh, was born in Sangerville in 1874. He left Maine at 16 to travel the world in search of gold. And he was shipwrecked. He was held prisoner by Russians. He finally struck it rich in Ontario and uh, uh, earning as much as $60,000 a day in 1911, which is probably the equivalent of a couple million dollars now. He was knighted in 1939. He had a mansion in Bar Harbor, which eventually became the Atlantic Oceanside Hotel, and a house in the Bahamas. And he was mysteriously bludgeoned to death uh, in 1943, and that crime was never solved. We talk about irascible Mainers. I think uh, one of the best stories I like is about the fishing guides that went with uh, Dwight Eisenhower when he went up in the Rangeley area in 1955 and he was president at the time and there was quite a retinue of Secret Service agents and reporters. They said everywhere Ike went there were a minimum of 70 people around him at all, all times and his first day trying to fish on the McGalloway River he didn't get a single bite and his, his, uh, his guide felt really bad, his guide Don Cameron. So they went back to the camp that afternoon and Don got on the phone and called all his guide friends and said, I want you to catch as many big fish as you can, take them up to Little Boy Falls, put a little net underneath the water at the outlet and fill it with those big fish. So at breakfast the next day, Don casually said to the president, I think if we go back there and try again, you might catch a fish. Well, Eisenhower landed a big trout. He was quite happy. And now there's a bronze plaque commemorating that as the Eisenhower uh, fishing pool. Um, and the picture in the center, Eisenhower was quite a painter and uh, he had such a fond relationship with Don that he actually painted that picture of the guide, which is in the center image here, uh, which now resides in the Outdoor Heritage Center up in, up in Rangeley. Uh, Maine has a lot of spooky things that go bump in the night and I won't go into any of these in super detail, but we talk a little bit about them in the book. And there was the Cherryfield Goatman, the Turner Beast, Phippsburg Screecher, Many Mems Howler and the Casco Bay Cassie, the, the sea serpent. And uh, I think anytime you have a lot of wilderness and, and uh, you have a lot of hardship, there's, uh, it's always nice to kind of fantasize about those kind of things that might be out there. And speaking of that, the Cryptozoology Museum in uh, Portland uh, is a one of a kind. And it supposedly is dedicated to the study of basically animals for which there's no proof that they exist. Uh, you'll find Yeti hair and lake monsters and an uh, uh, eight foot tall life-size Sasquatch and other oddities. It was opened by Lauren Coleman in 2003 and conveniently it's located right next to the Bissell Brothers Brewery. So I think you can have a couple of beers and kind of uh, uh, get the right attitude. So that's sort of the fixed part of the presentation. I always like to say at this point, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to take your questions or hear about some of the things that you think should be if we do a volume two, because uh, like I said, we have over 300 items left over we didn't cover. Uh, but I also mentioned that uh, I wanna be thankful for main libraries and also ask folks, look, support your local bookstores, the Owl and Turtle in Camden, Hello, Hello Books in Rockland. I know uh, there's lots of other stores that have been selling Wild Weird Wonderful Maine, the, uh, um, uh, Main Sports Outfitter has and Island Port Press, which is my publisher. Uh, they really do a great job of preserving and bringing back Maine books that have been out of print. 
as well as uh, bringing other authors to light. And they have over 500 submissions a year for publication. So um, it's a great outfit and, and they really care about Maine. So let me stop the screen share here. And hopefully I haven't talked your ear off. All right. Awesome, thank you, Earl. Yeah, uh, if anyone you. has any questions, you can type into the chat or use the raise hand feature under participants or just unmute yourself and ask away. Someone mentioned about in integrating the Gazetteer. I think, um, I don't know how you go anywhere without a copy of the Gazetteer in Maine. I keep the freshest one with the latest copyright date behind the seat in the Tacoma. And then I have another one next to my desk when I got it. Oh, where's that again? And then finally, I have a third copy that I like to cut up and use when I'm doing some backpacking or some canoeing in Northern Maine just to add to my maps and, and, and other kind of route finding things. So I, I can't say enough. Their, their headquarters, we talk about that in the book, uh, where Eartha, the largest uh, actual moving globe on the planet, is located there in, uh, in Freeport. That's not Delorme's headquarters anymore, but you can still, uh, at the very least, pull into the parking lot and see it through the window. Howdy, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, cool. I'm not, I don't know if, it, if it's weird or just misinformed. The Rockland Breakwater has, there's one stone that goes all the way across it. And okay. half of the people say, oh, that's just a halfway mark. And other people are like, oh no, that's just, you know, this really cool thing that there's one rock on the Rockland Breakwater that reaches the entire span. Is it the halfway mark? Or is it some other weird thing where people are like, ah, oh, nah, this was just this amazing piece of stone that they had. And Because when I was a kid, we'd always walk it. And anyone, you always forget where the hell it is because it's a rock surrounded by rocks. And the first one to find it would always be like, all right, cool. You, feel, you, you find it, everybody else owes you ice cream at Dorman's. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so is it, is it like, is it a special rock or is it just a halfway point? Yeah, you know, I haven't heard that. It'd be, it'd be fun to look into. I, I would like to start the legend that maybe there's a there's a, some kind of a mythological creature buried underneath it or something of that nature. Yeah, I'm all for that because it, it was always special to me. And then someone was like, that's the halfway mark, idiot. And I'm like, well, but not really, because I, I walk. It doesn't. I mean, it is about halfway, but I'd rather say that it's yeah, it's some sort of dragon thing. Well, let's let's put it out there. Does anybody here know the answer to that? I, I guess it might remain a mystery for a while. That's kind of good, actually. Yeah, it is. You know, you don't want to know the answer to everything. <laughs> and I keep getting free ice creams at Dorman's whenever I find it first, whenever you're walking <laughs> out there with buddies. That's the rule. Yep. Uh, Jim Dugan shared that he heard it was the halfway mark, but doesn't know for sure. Yeah, it seems a little close to the, a little close to shore, but everybody says it's a mile long and it's not. It's like... Yeah. 4,000 something. Right. Great. Other questions? Other things people want to share? Sure. There's an estate in um, Glen Cove, Maine that they wrote about in Down East and Aldous Huxley came and visited and there were a lot of psychics there. And um, they also experimented in psychedelic drugs. And I wondered if you had heard of that at all. No, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I, I do not. You know, I think the, the strangest one that I've come across in putting the book together was, uh, you know, up, at, up in Rangeley with the uh, Oregon Energy and Wilhelm yes. Reich and uh, his house. And it was interesting when my wife and I took the tour there and I noticed they had large sheets of plexiglass over the books in the library. And uh, somebody said, well, that's because they haven't, autographed copy of Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler there, and they're just worried about people stealing it. But, uh, you know, in Maine, they always say folks are pretty pretty casual as long as you're not doing anything to, you know, in the middle of the road to frighten the horses. And, you know, here was a guy that came up with all these theories about sexual energy and machines to make it rain. And and uh, he was pretty well accepted up there in Rangeley. And uh, uh, as, even though he was pursued by the federal government and his books were burned and he went to prison, uh, 
it's, uh, you know, he still found a home here. And I think that's pretty interesting. Hmm. Yeah. I'll send you a link of information about the place in Gun Cove because it is something you might want to research more. No, I'd, I'd love to. Um, continue on the breakwater. Somebody mentioned there were three crosses painted on the breakwater and they heard that that was where a family had been hit by lightning. Does anyone know about that? Yes, not. It's uh, sounds I heard like that, I heard though that, yeah, I heard people were struck on it, but I never heard about the crosses. And of course, everybody refers to it. Oh, no, yeah, it was in the courier. So it, that may be true. <laughs> well, that's something else to check out. You know, I think one thing we, we didn't mention tonight, I think is uh, a great thing in Maine is for those of you who've been up to Aroostook County and they have a scale model of the solar system there. So when you drive the roughly 40 miles from Holton uh, to Presque Isle, you're actually covering the same distance on a scale that you would from Pluto to the sun. And uh, when the space probe was launched to Pluto and it was going to send its first photos back, well, it was probably a decade ago now, they actually had a series of runners that started in Holton and ran to Presque Isle. And they actually ran faster than the speed of light on a scale basis and reached Presque Isle at the same time that the photographs from Pluto uh, reached the Earth. And I thought that was a, a pretty cool event. And they've extended it now, including Oort cloud and, and comets and other objects that uh, you can actually start in, nor in north of Maine and Canada and go all the way down into Washington County if you want to travel the, the entire solar system in an afternoon. Great. Well, if there's not any other questions, thank you everyone for coming. It's been fun and, and uh, anybody has some great wild weird things, certainly reach out to me, I'd love to hear them.